Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. Actually, I'm in New York with Ieta Pesnikova, who is an associate professor of economics at Royal Holloway University of London, who, despite what I thought, is talking to us from a resort on the Baltic in Latvia. <laughs> so we are in unusual places. And Ia, among many other things, is an expert on economic inequality. And what I want to talk about with her this afternoon is some very, very simple things, just some facts about inequality. And I think these facts are important to know, both to think about what we're talking about and what's been happening. So, Ia, let me ask you my first question. How do we measure, in very simple layperson's terms, economic inequality? Uh, thanks, uh, Dan, for having me, <laughs> first of all. Very happy to talk about it. Um, so first, I think uh, two things that we have to keep in mind uh, when talking about, before even starting to talk about how we measure economic inequality is one is what kind of measurements or summary measurements we could use and another is inequality of what. And I think both of them uh, are important. So let me first maybe uh, start with dimensions of economic inequality, just briefly. So we could think about inequality of uh, outcomes and inequality of opportunities. Most of us uh, can agree that uh, like inequality of opportunities is a bad thing. We want people to have the same education opportunities, growing up opportunities, you know, access to health uh, um, services that would be equal across people, no matter whether you're born into a well-off family or not. This is, of course, harder to measure. So economists tend to then um, practically look at things that are maybe easier to capture, which is inequality in outcomes. The most commonly used measures or the dimensions uh, of inequality, household income and uh, um, household consumption. Um, typically, the choice between, so that what exactly we're using is also important. So we could think of some shocks to income, like unemployment, if you lose your job, uh, your income goes down. And people who are unemployed, they would have a uh, lower income, of course, than others who maybe have a job. But our consumption is not expected to drop by so much, right? So usually- Let me ask you this, then. Let me, let me ask you, would you prefer yeah. to use consumption if you control the world? Would you prefer that people look at consumption inequality or income inequality? It is a very good question, actually. I think um, consumption inequality is um, probably what we want to look at in terms of, you know, it's linked to permanent income. So uh, if you have a good year or a bad year, your consumption is not going to change that much. So maybe consumption is what we want to look at. I mean, ideally, we even want to measure maybe happiness and uh, satisfaction. <laughs> that's uh, always more subjective. So consumption measures, of course, are more objectives. Um, but quite often in practice, it uh, boils down to uh, what data we have available. So for most uh, developed countries, we tend to use income data because we have very good administrative data now uh, coming from tax authorities so we know exactly how much people are earning so it's easier to get noise free kind of measure, you know good measurement data of income and then look at differences in 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 income uh, earned across people do we want um, me ask you this let me interrupt yeah. do we want to look at income inequality or earnings inequality you mentioned earning is data, but you say income. Which do you think we should be right. doing? So probably probably both, because the difference between <laughs> them is important. So we could think of earning inequality like labor. So most people, for most people, their earnings are coming from labor earnings. So they get a job and they have a wage from that job. Uh, a smaller fraction of the population would also have capital income. So maybe they have some dividends from their savings uh, if they hold some stocks and shares, 
or if they own some property, they might have some rent from it. So total income would include all of these measures. So looking at inequality, if so, if we want to talk about, um, so here we could also talk about income and wealth. So we could have somebody who is rich in terms of income. So, for example, young professionals in London, they would have very good income, right? Their wages would be high, but they would be poor in terms of their wealth because they don't have that many assets. And conversely, you could have older generation who managed to get very nice houses when they were maybe younger. So this is uh, something that, uh, you know, we're struggling now uh, and also personally look, looking at uh, a house uh, now in London, it's impossible to buy it. Uh, so <laughs> you could be rich in terms of wealth um, as a old individual maybe who managed to get a house a long time ago, but you could be poor in terms of income if the only income you get is retirement pension that is quite low. Right? So all of these differences are actually important and it depends on what kind of policies we want to discuss like if we're talking about first uh, buyer home buying policies or if we talk about government transfers and employment benefits do we want to look at income before tax or after tax so okay. a lot of these measurements are um will depend on the question at hand Okay, let me ask you this, though, okay? Okay, I mean, clearly a lot of nuances to be thought about here. But let's assume that we've chosen a whole bunch of different things to look at, okay? And we've devised measures of summarizing them. Is there going to be any difference in how they develop over time? In other words, I take two different things to look at. Aren't the trends going to be more or less the same? depending almost regardless of which of these measures I look at, or would there be some distinctly different inferences to be drawn depending upon which I use? That's a very good question. So if you look if you look at different papers that uh, like recent research looking at um, measurements of both consumption and income inequality for those countries where we have data on both, right? Where it's like, for example, in the US, there is actually no consensus whether um, income inequality was increasing faster than consumption inequality or the trends were diverging. So different, different uh, kind of papers are suggesting different results. But I think what is true is that if we compare countries, uh, compare inequality across countries, then these measures are uh, aligned. So whether we look at consumption inequality or income inequality in South Africa versus um, the US or the UK, um, or let's say Nordic Scandinavian countries, uh, then no matter which which measurement we take, the outcome will be the same. So at least the ranking of countries internationally will be stable. Uh, okay, so, basically, yeah. so what you're saying is basically that taking very broadly different countries, it doesn't matter what we use, we're going to get the same conclusion. But what if we look at a narrower range of wealthy countries, and I want to compare, for example, the US and the UK, will I get the same conclusion no matter which measure I use, or will I get different conclusions? Um, I th think it will depend on um, what exactly uh, sort of where the data comes from, like what exactly we take into consumption, for example, housing value, rent, whether that's part of it, uh, whether access to health uh, insurance, you know, whether and services like this, whether they are included in your consumption measure or not. So. I think uh, mo most of the time you get uh, you get it. Uh, so I think most literature says that uh, consumption and income inequality has been increasing over the last 30, 40 years, so roughly since 1980s um, in most developed countries. This is true for the US and this is true for the UK. Awesome. Let me ask you this then. Okay, it's been increasing. 
has it in the last since 1900 in the U.S. or the U.K. Has inequality by some measure ever been as high as it is now? Or are we hitting an all time last hundred years peak in inequality? Where do we stand over the last hundred years? That's a um, that's a good uh, that's a yeah good question. I mean, we do have much more data now, so like what we measure now is more precise. Uh, so you could think of you know surveys where maybe people were underreporting their income, um, or there is also a top coding. So we never report. Um, exactly the highest income that uh, that people have so there is uh, kind of just to protect people's um, identity right so we do that um so what you're saying then is not, that basically yeah. oh, go ahead go ahead so now the the administrative data that would come from tax authorities that's more precise so you would get also very high incomes so i think somewhat mechanically you would also have you would capture just more inequality now than it was before. Uh, and then the question is what, so maybe yeah, let's go, let's go a little bit, talk about the measurements. So very common uh, and easy to understand, very intuitive measure is to look at the percentile ratios. So take top 10% of the population, see what is their income and look at either the median um, so median earning in the economy, and then look at the ratio. So how many times more is the um, uh, income of the top 10% of the population compared to the medium? And then we could also look at the medium compared to the bottom 10%. So this is, um, yeah, so th these ratios are, uh, they're easy to understand. They are uh, very intuitive. Um, and these measures has been, have been increasing um, over the last, so maybe from, I think for the UK, it went from, um, so top 10 to bottom 10%, the ratio went from eight in uh, uh, 1980s to about 11, 12 um, now. So it was a, so it's a, it's a large increase. Uh, this is definitely true. I think in the U.S. it went from about 10 to 15 or something like that. I know it was both higher in the early 80s when it was near a low and maybe at 9 to 15. And now it's much higher still. I think that's pretty much what we see in all the wealthy Northern European and in North, North America all. Okay, my question is the following. All we care about now everywhere in the world is COVID, okay? <laughs> and Ia told me that she's actually in quarantine in Latvia, having come from England a few days ago. So my question is, what is COVID going to do to all this? A, not to inequality, but to our ability to measure inequality. Um, yeah, that's... a. Uh... Uh, that's very tricky, um, I think, because there is a lot of disruption happening. Uh, if we think what COVID is doing now, it's... Uh, um, so the good news is that we're still collecting data. So I think and there is, you know, some new surveys that are happening now. So we'll get more data on income that people are earning. Um, and also on hours of work, so how much they actually are working, um, okay. and maybe uh, if they're working at all, they could also have some income from furlough schemes, right? So it's really actually tricky to think about labor earnings as uh, wages times uh, hours, because we might actually have zero hours now, but people would be still getting some um income either subsidized from the government or yeah unemployment so either new schemes or unemployment insurance um, benefits uh, but the the tricky part of course is that uh, uh, covid will affect different industries in a very asymmetric way so um, and it's so services will be uh, affected more um, and 
those are so some services um, like restaurants and hotels and uh, um, retail these are exactly sectors that are being hit and of course those are the ones that typically have lower wages so we would expect that uh, um, it's uh, workers that are getting low wages would be getting even lower wages or lower income so we would expect inequality to increase i think over over the time but uh, the and i think it will it will come out in the data so we i know there are some new new surveys that are happening in the uk and also in in other countries so i think everyone it's a it's a tough times but uh, um economists love natural experiments so there will be a lot of research i expect uh, happening uh, on on this data and uh, studying this effect that's the only good conclusion that gives jobs to economists things to do but the overall conclusion i would argue is pretty depressing anyway Ia, let me thank you very much for being with me this afternoon and uh it's a difficult subject thanks again thank you dan